Well, hey, everybody. Happy Mother's Day. I want to uh, honor you moms. Uh, I want to welcome all of our locations. And uh, hey, we have some uh, neat stuff for you. But uh, this is how I want to do this today. I I would like to recognize all the moms and grandmoms. And one of the ladies that had just um, uh, an awesome impact in my life was one of my teachers who had no children. But I tell you what, she was like a mom to me. And there, there are several people in the room that will be moms one day. So here's what we're going to do, guys. We are going to ask all the ladies at every location to stand, and we want to honor every lady in the room today. So would you stand? We just want to thank you for all that God's done in your life, okay? Thank you so much, okay? God bless you guys. Hope you have an awesome day with your family. Uh, Today, I want to share a message with you on Mother's Day, and I could not help but think about the mother of Jesus uh, during this time, and we've been in this series called Hope Rising, and we started on Easter Sunday with this idea of uh, Easter is really a third day story. You know, you have Friday where Jesus is crucified, then you have Saturday where it's just absolutely silent, Uh, it seems as Jesus is dead. And then you have the third day resurrection story. And many of us find ourselves in those Saturday experiences of our lives where we're praying and God's not seeming to answer and we're struggling even in our life and our spiritual life. And we're just wondering, does God have any power to help me through the situation I find myself in? So I thought about this and I thought, let's go back to Mary, the mother of Jesus, And think about her life from the very beginning when she finds out she's pregnant with Jesus. I mean, she is mocked and she is, uh, you know, uh, people are spreading all kinds of critical comments about her. She was, of course, conceived by a virgin. Her and Joseph were dating and ready to be married, but it became a, a shameful thing for her. And she maintained the course, you know, she stayed steady. God gave her a word. This is my son in whom you're going to bear. And then she has Jesus in a, yeah, my goodness, in a, in a manger, in a barn. Uh, we sort of glorify it, but uh, we know that a barn's a barn. And then as Jesus was raised, trying to learn carpentry skills, and then as he begins to teach at 12 years old, I mean, there were a lot of situations where Mary had many, many trials as she raised Jesus. And then, you know, think about the cross, guys. Uh, Mary is at the cross when Jesus is being crucified. She had seen her son, whom she'd raised and loved and held, being beaten and tortured almost beyond recognition. She saw the nails and the spikes go into his hands and feet, and there she is at the cross. It had to be excruciating for her. And this is what amazes me. That all the things that were going through the mind of Jesus, becoming the sacrifice, the, you know, the, the paying for the sins of the world, for our sin that day on the cross. He looks down, the scripture says, and he sees his mother. Uh, John writes about this, and let's pick up the story, and let's notice what Jesus says. It says, standing near the cross where Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, of course, this is John, John's writing this. He says to her, dear woman, here's your son. And he said to his disciple, here is your mother. And from then on, this disciple, John, took her into his house. Uh, With everything that is in the weight and the balance of Jesus right before he dies, he sees his mother and he says, I've got to care for my mother. I want to be an example to care for my mom. And he tells John, all right, John, the responsibility of caring for my mom is in your hands now. And we know that actually John took Mary into his house and treated her like his mother until she passed away. So John fulfilled this promise that he makes to Jesus. Now, fortunately, uh, we are able to know quite a bit about the mother of Jesus. Uh, Mary was a credible lady. It's the reason God chose her, right? And in the midst of being this person that God has chosen for this incredible privilege of bringing God into the world, uh, you know what resonates all throughout Mary's life? She often found herself in situations where she felt she was in over her head. And when she found in situations like that, she resorted to prayer every time. She was a, she was a woman of prayer. She was a lady of prayer. So I want to teach on prayer just a little bit today. 
And then we're going to share a story of uh, just a, a neat second day story that ends up being a third day story. And I want to help you understand as we sort of navigate through uh, Mary's life, we see that she was often uh, facing lots of trials. I love how Paul puts this in Romans chapter 12. Notice what he says out of the Phillips translation. So it's when trials come, in other words, we're all going to experience trials, endure them patiently. And then he says, steadfastly maintain the habit of prayer. So when you find yourself in over your head, you find yourself in a Saturday experience, maintain the habit of prayer. Jesus taught a lot about prayer, didn't he? He wanted his disciples to know how to pray. We have that prayer that you hear at the end or the beginning of football games and sports teams. They pray the Lord's Prayer. But right after he gave the disciples the Lord's Prayer, he continues to teach on prayer. And I think this one really resonates with all of us today. Notice the story when we find ourselves in a trial where we're in over our head. This is a neat story. It says, then teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. And you say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me, the door's locked for the night. My family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. But I tell you this, Jesus says, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he'll get up and he'll give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. And so I tell you, keep on asking and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you'll find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, you give them a steak instead. Or if they ask for an egg, you give them a scorpion. Of course not. So... If you sinful people, that's all of us, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You know, this story helps us understand prayer. Jesus is trying to help his disciples to get it. And he gives three principles here about prayer. I want you to write these down. Here's the first one. Sometimes all of us are disappointed prayers, aren't we? We have this prayer that we want God to answer. We are in a situation over our head or we're grieving and we're hurting and we go to God and we say, all right, God, fix this. And it's a Saturday. We don't hear anything from God and our prayers go unanswered. We're disappointed prayers. This happened to this guy uh, here in the middle of the night. He's asleep. He gets one of his buddies comes and starts knocking on his door, wakes him up. And he says, hey, you know, I've traveled a good distance. I've had nothing to eat. And he decides, all right, I'm going to go over to my neighbor's house because I know he always has food and I'll get you something to eat. And he goes over and he knocks on the door of his neighbor. And what does his neighbor say? Hey, leave me alone. I'm already asleep. All the family's already asleep. I'm not going to answer the door. If I do, it's going to disturb all my family. And so this guy is a disappointed prayer, right? Uh, when we are disappointed in our prayers, what happens? Uh, why does God not answer? Well, sometimes we ask for the wrong things, don't we? Uh, I remember when Brenda and I got married, we were a little older when we got married. Uh, I was 28 and she was a couple of years younger. And so we were already sort of setting our ways. And the first couple of years we got married, it was, it was tough. It was a little hard. And I remember just praying this prayer over and over and over. And I thought, uh, you know, Lord, if you'll just answer this prayer, marriage is going to be awesome. You know what it was? Lord, change Brenda. <laughs> you know? If you'll just change her, it'll all it'll be taken care of. But as I matured, and she never changed, you know, I definitely wasn't the one to change her. Uh, I said, God changed me, and our marriage got a lot better. Uh, sometimes we just ask for the wrong things. Sometimes we ask with the wrong motives. It's interesting, in the Bible, there's a, a mom who says to Jesus, hey, when you get into your kingdom, I'd love for my two boys to sit on the right and left hand of you. Uh, in other words, elevate my boys, take care of my boys, give them a little bit bigger mansion, you know, uh, put them right there with you, Jesus. And Jesus says, you don't even know what you're asking for. My way is the way of the cross. My way is the way of suffering. My way is the way of death. And she was asking 
but her motive was wrong. A um, few months ago when Powerball or Mega Millions, whichever one it was, got almost to a billion dollars, I had several uh, Highlanders request, uh, Pastor, we bought some tickets for this Mega Million thing, and um, we would love for you to sort of, we would like our pastor to pray that we'll win this thing. And if we do, we'll be very generous with the church and, and uh, you'd be amazed how many requests I got about that. But I, I don't know what happened. We never got any large checks. So, you know, sometimes our prayers are disappointed because we asked with the wrong motive. Disappointed prayers. I believe everyone in every location has been a disappointed prayer before, haven't we? Uh, the second thing Jesus teaches in this story is that we can move from disappointed to a developing prayer. He said, what's a developing prayer? It's just a disappointed prayer who refuses to give up. I love this guy. You know, he's over there and the guy says, hey, you know, I'm not coming down. No way. Uh, we're already in bed. And you know what this guy does? He just keeps on knocking, keeps on knocking, keeps on knocking. And finally... You know, the guy gets up, his neighbor gets up and he comes down and he grants him the request. Uh, it's interesting to me that this person, number one, friend, number one, knows the neighbor to go to. Now we all know maybe in our neighborhoods, neighbors that we would never go to in the middle of the night, they might kill us or something, but he must've had a decent relationship with this uh, other neighbor that he felt like I can go in the middle of the night and ask for my need. And even though he was disappointed in the beginning, he knew his buddy would eventually get up and answer his request, which he did. Tells me that he had a relationship with this neighbor. You know, if you're here today and you're having situations where you're in over your head and every prayer you're, you pray is just disappointing, you don't get an answer. Uh, you know what I think? Uh, it may be that you've never started a relationship with Jesus. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus and admit your need for him, you're always going to be disappointed in your prayer life. So at the end of my little talk today, I'm going to give you an opportunity uh, to move from a disappointed prayer to a developing prayer. And eventually to this third thing I want you to see, a devoted prayer. How do you become a devoted prayer? Well, you begin to realize... Prayer works one of two ways. Let me, let me give you these two ways. Uh, here's the first thing that God will do. God will change sometimes your circumstances and answer the prayer you pray exactly like you pray it. All of us could probably say God's answered some of our prayers. Sometimes he'll change your circumstances. I love the story of Hezekiah in the Old Testament. And Hezekiah is about to die and he's not finished with what he believes God created him for. And so he goes to God and he says, God, would you heal me? And would you give me some more years? You know what God did? And he didn't kill Hezekiah and Hezekiah lived 15 more years. God changed his mind. And sometimes God will change your circumstances and he'll answer the prayer exactly like you want to pray. Other times, God's not going to change your circumstances. But this is what I found. If you're a devoted prayer, he will change you in the circumstances. Uh, we have a, an example of this with Paul, right? Paul had this thorn in the flesh, and he goes to God three times. He says, God, I could serve you so much better if you'll just get rid of this thorn in my flesh. I know you're capable of doing it. We don't know exactly what it was. But every time, what was the response? I'm not going to change your circumstances, Paul. I'm going to change you. And the way I'm going to change you is even though you got a thorn in your flesh, here's the deal. My grace for you is sufficient. I want to challenge you today. When you find yourself in a situation where you feel like you're in over your head, start praying. And maybe you'll have some disappointed prayers. But a developing prayer is just a disappointed prayer who refused to give up. And then eventually, you will be a devoted prayer, just like this story illustrates in our mind. I want you to watch a video now that is the story of Lindsay and Brian Lawson. Lindsay works for us here at Highlands. Many of you know Lindsay. She's an incredible lady. And uh, she and Brian were willing to share their Saturday story with us on Mother's Day so that we could see how this family moved from disappointment 
to devotion and trust in Jesus Christ when they found themselves in a situation in over their heads. Watch this video and then I'll wrap us up. We're in our Hope Rising series, and really this whole series is all about how uh, we're in those Saturday moments sometimes. You know, we've talked about at Easter, how Easter is a third day story, a resurrection story, but so much of it that we don't think about is that it's a difficult time, right? The disciples are confused and concerned. They're scared. They don't know that Jesus is going to come back. They're just in that Saturday moment. And I think so many of us, really all of us, if you've lived long enough, have experienced those Saturday moments in your life. And so Lindsay's here with us, and uh, we're going to kind of walk through one of those experiences in your life. Sure. Um, my biggest Saturday moment came yeah. uh, January 18th, 2018. I remember the minute, the second, the place. But um, I don't think anything ever prepares you for the words that your child's heart has stopped beating. Yeah. And so uh, we were expecting a second baby and um, we were two years and two days apart from ultrasound where I had had a baby girl before who we had found out she had an omphalocell, which was a significant birth defect. So going mm -hmm. into that ultrasound, I couldn't imagine that I was gonna receive bad news, mm -hmm. right? I thought my bad news had already yeah, happened. You've already, already, you've already had that experience. I've already had that experience. So um, as I laid there on that same bed and I looked at the screen, it was clear to me that we had no heartbeat on this baby boy. And I was mm. pretty far along, 14, almost 15 weeks. And so that's yeah. also something you're not expecting. Yeah. We had heard some news that he had had Down syndrome from some genetic testing, but we were still super excited for yeah. this baby. So that's probably the deepest Saturday moment that I've felt. Um, a difference though in the two experiences is the first time I did not know Jesus. I mm. knew about Jesus. I had known him at one time. And so when I heard that my baby girl had that birth defect, it felt really hopeless. It yeah. felt like I had, there was no hope. Yeah. But when I found out that worst news, two days and two days apart about this yeah. baby, for a split second, I thought, well, my heart stopped beating too. Yeah. But then I felt the comfort of Jesus because I knew Jesus and he was right there holding yeah. my right hand just like he always promised that he would and yeah. I knew that when we left there that my Jesus was going to be the same before I entered that room that he was when I left yeah so you have this difficult experience where you know there's no heartbeat now there's there is this sort of feeling of loss and then and then the doctors share with you that you probably are not going to have the opportunity to get pregnant again. Yeah, sure. So we went through that terrible season. And in that time, um, it was difficult to pray. Lots of things were super difficult. We were surrounded by a small group of people that really loved on us. And yeah. so, you know, we're still having some hope at this point. We're still hopeful. But we go back to the doctor a few months later once we've gotten ourselves together a little bit better. Yeah. And the doctors basically share with me that um, I'm premenopausal. My levels are high, that the time has probably passed us by mm. but you know what Jesus has perfect timing yeah um, and I didn't really know that you never know you're right. in a resurrection story until you're way on the other side yeah. but even then I think God had changed us he had changed Brian he had changed me yeah. we were living and depending on him that you know we weren't depending on something working out another right. baby but we were just happy with Jesus we yeah. had learned that he was enough no matter what yeah that's good and so you're in that moment of there's loss and there's trust, you know, and there's a there's just a tension there. And I think so many times in our life we want to run away from those tensions. But the ten, in that tension is where we find God, right? It's where we find the Holy Spirit who is our comforter yes. in those moments of difficulty. Yes, and that's what I had the second time, right? Yeah. I had the Holy Spirit, and he really, the Holy Spirit sang songs into my spirit during that time, even mm. when I had a difficult time praying and sent other people to comfort me. My small yeah. group, Alex Wilson, our uh, praise and worship pastor at the time, yeah. um, now he has a different job title, but yeah. anyway, he wrote a song straight into my heart during that wow. time and I know all that was sent by the Holy Spirit yeah and so so you can look back even in those moments where you don't see all of it we can look back and see that God really does work all things for our good and his glory um, but good doesn't always mean like um, fun or safe or feeling good 
uh, but it's for our good. And sometimes our good is to benefit others. Right. Like that's what I had to learn, right? Yeah. God was changing me to understand that it wasn't all about me, yeah. right? Sometimes working things out for your good is that you need to grow and you need to stretch. And sometimes it's yeah. totally for his glory. And sometimes working things out for his good is for somebody else. Yeah. Your story becomes a light into somebody else's life and somebody that you can testify with or yeah. share your experiences with that maybe couldn't come to Jesus at all, yeah. right? Yeah. So you're in the Saturday moment, but you're feeling the trust. You're feeling that hope rising. Uh, and then something unexpected comes. Sure. Um, so it really started out of a message that Pastor Allen delivered to our staff at a staff yeah. meeting. So we were at a staff meeting a little bit before Thanksgiving, and uh, we were gearing up for the busy Christmas season. And yeah. he was just sharing with us that as a staff um, and a ministry, our rewards are not here, right? Yeah. Our rewards yeah. are definitely in heaven. And he talked about the Good Samaritan and what he said to the innkeeper, which is a different perspective of the story. Sure. But basically, the Good Samaritan says to the innkeeper, hey, if there's anything I owe you for taking care of this guy, right, I'll make it up to you. Yeah. And uh, Pastor Allen was saying, you know, I feel like Jesus is saying that to us as a staff. Mm -hmm. Like, your rewards aren't here. I'll make it up to you. Yeah. And um, and I, I was super excited about that message, and yeah. I received it, and I thought, you know what? He's right. Anders, the baby that I lost, is in yeah. heaven, right? Yeah. God's going to make that up to me. It's a brief whisper in time here that we're here, and then I'll have eternity with him. And I thanked Jesus for, for that in that moment. Yeah. But as I left the church and I got in that big curve, and if anybody's been to the Abingdon campus, they know where your cell phone drops. Yeah. I heard audibly, I'll make it up to you. Hmm. And again, I was thankful and teary. And yeah. I said, thank you. I know, Jesus, that you will. Like, I know that heaven's going to be amazing. I know that my riches aren't here. I know that my rewards aren't here. I know if I can just fight a good fight, right, I can finish this, that I'll have. I'll have the things that I've desired, right? right? And that's okay. Like, sometimes I think we have to realize sometimes the desires of our heart might not happen here. Yeah. They might not. They yeah. may happen in, in heaven. And so, um, and so that, I just kind of moved on. And then a couple weeks later, I just went on with my days, and I was pregnant then, hmm. <laughs> but didn't know. Wow. And so um, I decided to take a pregnancy test before a big workout at the gym because I was trying to get healthy and lose <laughs> weight. And, um, and yeah. so I took that test in the bathroom at the gym, and it instantly turned positive. And I, I heard it again, but louder and stronger. Hmm. I'll make it up to you. And then I knew what yeah. God was saying. Yeah. Like I knew exactly what it was. He was making it up to me right in that very moment. Yeah. I, every time that we talk about this, I just always get chills when you say that because it is just so incredible that as you sort of surrendered that to God, right? Like, God, I, I trust you with this and I don't even know why I'm in this situation, but I trust that you're good. And he's like, I've got you. <laughs> right. I, you don't even understand the, the depths that I hold um, for in your life. That's right. And we don't know his plans, right? Yeah. It says his plans for us are good, but yeah. we don't know what they are. We just yeah. have to trust that they are. And so you realize that you're pregnant. Uh, and then later that night, you realize that this is e not just any coincidence. No, it's a, it, so that night, uh, Brian and I sit down and we're super joyful. I've been to the doctor and yeah. um, he's confirmed it. Yeah. And so um, in his amazement too. Sure. And so, um, and so we're just super excited. And I look back at time hop. I do that frequently. I like to see sure. where my Romy Kate, like how she's grown, what's changed. And it's a picture of her in her big sister shirt telling her dad exactly the same day the year before. Mm. And so, um, which was pretty amazing. And, and we knew it was from God. And so those moments continued to happen. And I didn't even realize they were coming. So wow. we went to the doctor and I'd done a little calculation that I thought, and I knew the due dates were similar, but the yeah. doctor gave us the same due date a year apart, wow. July 29th. And then just a few days later, we got that genetic testing that we found out for Anders was not exactly what it needed to be. Yeah. And on the same day, one of the girls from Mops pointed out to me, I got the different news with Stella mm. Rose that her genetics were great. And it was yeah. the exact same day. And those coincidences just kept happening. But they weren't coincidences. That's right. They were confirmations. <clears throat> yeah. And so I, I, I just love this story so much. And, and we really wanted to share this with everyone because... And what a difference a year makes, right? right. And, and what an incredible work that God can do in your life when you just let him do it, right? Because it wasn't that you 
did good and then you got a reward <laughs> right no, god's absolutely just not. he's just good to us and i struggled in those yeah. times i don't want anybody to think for a second that yeah. we didn't have sad days and hard days oh, yeah. and days of struggle and days where i had some questions but i kept coming back to the scriptures from james that say consider it all joy mm. when you encounter trials of various kinds right yeah. um we don't know why we face those but but they're there yeah. and so we just had to consider it joy and man that's a hard place to get and that doesn't come overnight but mm. i had to say jesus for some reason we've gone through this whether it's for me to grow whether it's for your glory for something else or it's somebody else but we got there and a difference yeah. a year makes a year ago I was opening jewelry to remember a baby that I was never going to hold and this year I'm going to be 29 weeks pregnant with a baby that I hope I hold right yeah. we're still not there yeah. but the hope is there yeah. and the difference is no matter what James and I really mean this yeah. if something were to happen Jesus is going to be the same yeah. and he's still going to be holding my hand and yeah. he's still going to be there he's enough yeah. he's enough so what, what would you say to, to moms today as we're celebrating Mother's Day this weekend? It can be an exciting time for some. It can be a difficult time for others. Uh, what, what would you say to moms that are listening? I would just say we have to put our hope in Jesus, right? In yeah. someone and not something yeah. or some circumstance we hope is going to change, right? Yeah. So whether you're a mom who's only held a baby in their heart, they've never been able to experience pregnancy, or a mom who's only held a baby in their belly, not their arms, a mom who's brought a baby home they couldn't keep, or a mom who's lost a child this year, yeah. that a, a year can make a world of difference in any of those situations. But Jesus is their hope, and we just have to look back to him. Yeah, and really that's what this Hope Rising series, that's what it's all about, right, is that, man, in that Saturday, there's still hope, right? There is a resurrection story that God is writing, and it's bigger, it's greater than, than man, anything we could imagine, right? A year ago, you had no idea that any of this could happen, but God's good. And now a year later, we can just recognize how, how good he is, right? That he's exceedingly more than we need. He gives us what we need. He's faithful and he's true. And, and really that's, that's hope rising, right? That there's a resurrection coming, that our life is a third day story because God has done a great work for us <laughs> because of his love and his care for us. And so no matter where you are today, uh, watching this, experiencing this, conversation. I hope that you feel that hope rising inside of you. I hope that you feel uh, that God loves you and that he has a plan for you and that no matter how dark this night feels, uh, that it doesn't last forever. And maybe it doesn't work out the way that we think it does, but God is faithful to bring about those things because he's good and because he loves us and because he is for us. I so appreciate Lindsay and Brian for uh, making personal a story that I'm sure was hard to share with all of us, but they represent so well when we find a situation we're in over our head that Jesus will walk with us through that. Um, I want to share one last story with you and we'll finish. Uh, most of you know we've got five kids and, and we adopted uh, our last, our youngest son who is now nine. We started foster care and we fostered Chris for a few months and during those first few months before, a couple of years later, that we ended up adopting him, um, we started bringing him into our house, and we just loved on him and those kind of things. And I had to go uh, be a part of a wedding for one of our interns that was getting married, and so we had traveled, and I found, I thought all the kids would like a, you know, a hotel with a little indoor pool. So we find this little indoor pool, and we head up, and, and we tell Chris about it. You know, he hadn't had privileges like that uh, too much before, and so we get to hotel, and I've shared this story with some of you. We check in, and uh, you know he's got his swimming trunks on, and I say, "Let's go," you know. And of course, I'm not really thinking about getting in with him. And Timmy's gonna eventually get there, and we go down to the pool, and uh, you know I didn't really check, but the whole pool is is over Chris's head. Even the shallow end is over his head. So I talked to him. I got me a fresh cup of coffee. I'm answering some emails, and I said, "Now, Chris, can you swim?" And he said, "Oh, yeah." Yeah, I can swim, Dad. I'm good. I said, all right, dude, go after it. Enjoy. He jumps in the swimming pool straight to the bottom and doesn't move. I mean, just like a log right on the bottom. And I'm getting rid of my coffee and, you know, pulling out my wallet. I'm getting ready to jump in. And Timmy comes in, and I just go rescue Chris. You know, I throw Timmy in the pool. And I said, go, you know, your brother's drowning. So he gets Chris, you know, saves him. 
And then I notice as um, I eventually start swimming some with Chris and trying to help him a little bit, even though the whole pool is over Chris's head, when I'm in the shallow end with Chris and he's hugging on to me, he'd already started calling me dad then. Uh, he was happy and splashing and laughing. And then as dad would sort of take Chris out into the deep end of that little pool, he would tense up and, you know, he would get quieter and he would quit splashing. And you could just see, man, he was uncomfortable when dad gets into a situation that is almost over his head. And I'd move back to the shallow end, happy, laughing, and splashing. And you know what I learned that day about Chris? Chris was okay to be in water when he was in over his head, but he was not okay when his father was in over his head. Here's the deal, guys. If you know Jesus, you're going to find yourself in some situations where you feel like I'm in over my head. But you will never be in a situation where your father is in over his head. He can always take care of you. He can always see you through. So if you're here today and you don't have that relationship with Jesus on this Mother's Day, the greatest thing you could do for your mother, and the greatest thing you could do for yourself is make sure that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because you know what? You're going to find yourself one day in a situation over your head. And you're going to need his love. And his help to get you through. So would you all, would you pray with me? Let's give these folks an opportunity to make a commitment to Christ. And others of you who are Christians, that you might come home today. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for knowing that we don't understand life and all of its things that happen and come our way. We'll, we'll have to ask you when we get to heaven one day. Why certain things happen that are just unexplainable on this side of eternity. But Lord, if we know you... We know that we serve a father who is never in over his head. A lot of times we get in over ours. It causes us some tenseness and nervousness and all those kinds of things. But God, when we know that we are in the hands of our father who never gets in over his head and we can turn to you and you'll see us through and you'll walk with us through those times, that's awesome. I wonder this weekend, I'm sure, just like every weekend, maybe mom got you to come to church today and you, honestly, you have nothing for God. I, I just want to tell you, you're not here by coincidence or accident. God created you. He loves you. And if you feel as though you're in a situation, whether it be a relationship or an addiction or whatever it might be, that's just, you're in over your head. And you don't know Jesus. I just, I feel for you. Because you're always going to be in situations that you can't fix that you're going to be in over your head. So I just want to challenge you. Would you open up your life today and invite Jesus into your life? He created you. He knows how to best work in your life and for you to work with him. And if you want to do that, this is what the Bible says, how it happens. You just pray a simple prayer and you open up your heart. And you ask him to come in your life. So just pray this prayer to me. Just say, dear Jesus, as best as I know how today, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. God, I repent of my sin today. All of us have made mistakes. And I ask you to cleanse me. And I ask you to come into my heart today and save me. Today, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Thank you for saving me. And hey, if you prayed that prayer, man, we'd love to know about it. Our campus pastor will sort of share with you a next step real briefly. I pray today for all those that are here under my voice, the thousands of people this weekend that come to Highlands on Mother's Day. Just, God, give us a great day with our family as we celebrate all the things you've done for us. We love you today, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.